Hello, my friends. It's been way too long, but I wanted to come back and make this video because a few people actually have pointed me to this post, these screenshots that I have that I'm gonna read to you and to respond to this poor, poor woman who is a friend of mine and she's suffering and struggling so hard. But there are about five lessons, probably five or six that I took out of these posts that I wanna pass along to you guys that can help you in times where you're feeling hopeless and in despair, no matter where in your life that is. This is specific to a prison wife, the screenshots that I'm gonna to read to you, but you could take this and you could put this in any area of your life. People who are experiencing infertility, people who have bad diagnoses, people whose loved ones have become incarcerated, people who have waited for a loved one to be released from incarceration and it didn't work out after all those years. And honestly, anything in between, I don't have to say it. There are so many things that this could be used for in your own life. Yeah. Let's read the screenshots and then we'll talk through what I got from this and what I wanna pass along to you guys. So she said, I haven't said much because I really don't care at this point. This will be my last post in regards to fake clemency hearings. Yes, my husband is on the docket, but no, I don't really care at this point because we already know the outcome. The board will deny. It's okay. I have to accept that my husband's predicament won't change. He's stuck in a black hole. Please don't tell me to have hope because I don't. Please don't tell me to have faith because I don't. I'm apathetic to it all. I'm lucky to still be standing after all of this. My mental health was shot and I was broken. However, I found some help with medication and therapy. But honestly, I don't care about advocating and legal stuff anymore. I'm just glad it's over never being involved again. I think that's what, it, it's a few different posts um, and my computer is not cooperating. Sorry, I have them in um, screenshots and I can't scroll up and down, it's being weird. But anyway, she said, we literally have zero chances anymore. I will have to get the call one day that my husband has unalived himself one day because he refuses to be executed by the state. So let me give you background. This woman is the wife of a man who is on death row. They have gotten news where there was clemency hearings. They got word that the governor was really looking into this case. It seemed so promising. And then they were, were saying that the laws were gonna get changed. And I can understand this with my whole heart. Let me just stop right there and preface this. My husband never had a death sentence. He never had life on the books. He had a longer than life sentence. He had a number on the books, 213 years, which no one's going to live that long. But I say that to say, I cannot with my whole heart empathize with what this woman is going through at all. I was petrified every single day that he would die in prison because we'd never get this overturned. However, it wasn't the system that was trying to kill him. They were just trying to keep him there longer than anybody's life expectancy. So I can completely sympathize, but hers is heartbreakingly a step further and more difficult. I think what they were trying to, I think I could be wrong, but I think what they were trying to do was go from death to life and then get the life sentence overturned, I think. Regardless, there were so many highs and for anybody that's going through anything, right? A cancer diagnosis, you know, there's highs, there's lows, just like this with legal highs and lows. I'm saying that to say she's going through the worst of the worst of the worst with somebody who's incarcerated. But if you're listening to this and that's not your walk in life, that's not your journey, you can relate this to another area of your life. Okay. Let me open up my notes. So she said in there that please don't tell me to have hope. Please don't tell me this. I don't remember the exact words. I am not touching my computer again to find out, but you guys heard it. I read it. And what we sh she was like is like, I don't need to hear that. Here's the thing. She is so on the money with this. And that's such a huge lesson for us when we're dealing with somebody who is in a point where they're in despair and they just don't have anything left and they're done. It means more to tell somebody because I've been there. It sucks. I am so sorry. Sometimes it feels, I know for me, it feels better to hear that and to feel heard and seen and understood versus somebody who like throws cliches at you. I was just listening to a mom who lost her son for 16 years to a prison system, lost her mother to cancer at the exact same time and was diagnosed with cancer at the exact same time, all within like three months of one another. And she's like, don't tell somebody, please hear me when I say this, don't tell somebody, God won't give you more than you can handle because that's nonsense. 
obviously I was given a lot more than I can handle. I survived it clearly because I'm here, but like stop with the cliches, stop with everything. I understand that sometimes you want to give somebody hope and a silver lining, but sometimes when somebody is way beyond that, this woman has been doing this for so many years. I've known her maybe close to 10 years at this point. And it's the same struggle and she's at the end of her rope. She does not need to hear, have hope, hold on a little longer. Is that true? Sure. Does she need to hear that right now? No. Here's another step further. One of my girlfriends lost her husband to incarceration and then he died while he was incarcerated, unfortunately. And she's like, you know, I'm so sick of hearing somebody say, I'm sorry, let me know what I could do for you. I have no idea what I even need at this moment. So the point in saying that is sometimes you just have to do something for that person, come up with it on your own. You are smart enough to do that. Here's an example. When I was out to here pregnant, nine months pregnant, it was July, it was 115 degrees in Las Vegas. And I was at a point, I was swollen. I was just one day over it. You guys, if you've had a baby, you know the experience. I was over it one day. And one of my girlfriends texted to check up on me and she asked how I was doing. And I was like, oh my God, I'm at the end of my rope. And I just kind of complained to her for a second. She talked me through it. A couple of hours later, I get a knock on my door. She had sent me flowers and said, you're so close, just a couple more weeks till you get to meet your beautiful, tiny little human. And it was just so sweet. And it was what I needed in the moment. I didn't, she didn't say to me like, let me know how I could help. That's so distant. So if you really want to help, you know how to help. Maybe that person needs you to come over and clean their house. Maybe that person needs you to come over and just cry together. Maybe they need you to watch their kids so they can go just get a pedicure get a good cry, get a, you know, a walk in nature, whatever it is. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two, setting boundaries. This is in response to where she said like, I'm done with the legal stuff. I can't do it anymore. I am so proud of her for saying that because honestly, I got to that point with Adam and our relationship. It was causing a rift between us. It was too emotional for me. I had to pass off his legal stuff to the attorneys. Does that mean I didn't ask for letters, write letters, make some phone calls when I needed to help, when I was the only one that could do it? Of course I did. But 80 to 90% of the stuff was passed on to somebody who was trusted, the attorney, and he did it so I didn't have to. It was a burden off of my shoulder. I am not a lawyer. I barely, I don't speak legal ease. I don't understand a lot of the stuff. So I couldn't, nor did I want to do it. It was coming in between Adam and I in our relationship. So we passed that off. And I'm so glad that she's like, I'm not going to be involved in the legal stuff anymore because she shouldn't have to be. Here's the other thing. Once your boundaries are set, no matter how hard they want to push and ask, you have to stick to them with the caveat of some things it's only you. I mean, this is specifically for an incarcerated loved one. There are some things that only you could do those few things, but 85 to 90% pass it off to the other people and stick within that. It'll be so much healthier for you. Find the professionals, find the other friends on the outside that can help with those certain things. Designate that help in that area. Let that person handle those things and you stick to what feels the best and most comfortable for you. And that's the best for your mental health and your relationship. Lesson number three is letting go. You know that old phrase, let go and let God, let go and let the universe, whatever you believe in, just letting go. The word she used was apathetic and I am so proud of her and I know to you you, that might sound crazy or like I'm pushing for her to move away and like, oh, that's not what I'm saying at all. So I'm going to give you a story to help explain what I'm saying. When I was in my highs and my lows with Adam, I was really depressed about this situation where basically our bags were packed last minute, the rug was pulled out from under us and it didn't happen. And I was going through a really hard time. And my girlfriend, who's so sweet and so understanding, said to me, she's like, I truly believe in my gut with all of my being that Adam will be home one day. However, why don't you for now and for your own sanity start acting like he won't? So this way you could live your life as if he won't. So you won't get so hurt. And so you're not so attached to these things if and when they don't happen. And I tried for, I don't know, 25 seconds, like, just kidding. But I tried for as long as I could, but I couldn't do it anymore because I felt like I was in so deep that I couldn't take those steps backwards. So the fact that she's still willing to stay with him, but she's like, I'm just so numb to all of this. I'm just letting go and I don't believe in the legal stuff. Maybe that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. That just means she's not white knuckling and holding on with such a strong grip that if it doesn't happen in that moment, it's 
devastating to her. Now I can 100% empathize with this. It's not the same outcome because of this woman's husband's more severe sentence, but it's still the same exact emotions and the same exact letdown. And it is excruciating. If you haven't been in those shoes, God bless you. But if you haven't been in those shoes, it is the the biggest pain that you'll ever experience. And whatever your torture, whatever your um, experience is that you're gonna use this towards, you know that pain. So I just think that, that that apathy, that letting go, that I'm just so numb to this, that I'm done, is so healthy because it'll help her not have those highs and those lows. Does that mean it's gonna be easy or you're never gonna get attached to something again? Of course not, you're human. And if something positive seems like it's coming in front of you, yes, you might get excited and that's okay. But once you learn to live with that apathetic attitude, we'll say, then I can say from experience, it helps. So when Adam was uh, about a week before release, I drove up there to go pick him up. We thought it was time. It wasn't, I drove six hours stayed overnight to drive six hours home. Literally people were in the air flying to come celebrate this homecoming and it never happened. So we didn't know when it was gonna happen. We didn't know if it was gonna be the weekend. We didn't know if it was gonna be a week. We didn't even know if it was gonna be 10 more years. We had no idea. The judge just wanted time to think about it. At that point, I felt the exact same way. I said, I can't do this anymore. The highs are too high, the lows are too low. I'm way too attached to this outcome and I'm done. Like literally you guys, that was the closest I was ever to being done, to walking away. Would I, I don't think I would have, but I don't know. It was so painful. This was on, on Friday I drove up, on Saturday I drove home. Now here we are on Monday, I'm waiting. Maybe we'll get a phone call. Maybe he wanted to sleep on it over the weekend. Nothing, Tuesday morning, I get up nine o'clock. We're in COVID, working from home, set up my computer. I was about to just eat breakfast really quick and then I'm gonna unpack my car and be done. That's when I got the phone call from the attorney that Adam got immediate release and I could go pick him up. And I was like, okay, what do I do? Do I go up there? Like literally, this is my tone. Okay. And his wife is screaming, doing backflips in the background. So ecstatic. Like, this is it. It's happening. He's like, bro, this is it. It's happening. He got immediate release. I'm like, okay. So what do I do? Literally looking back, I was joking with him later and I'm like, I probably seemed like such a crazy person, but in the moment I could not get attached to that because I didn't believe it. I will believe it when I see it. I'll believe it when he's in my car, driven away from the prison. It was the boy that cried wolf at that point. You know what I mean? So that's where I'm saying the apathy helps and it does, it works for these situations. Okay, next one. She said that she had been seeing a therapist and that she was placed on medication. Amazing. You need to know when it's time to get professional help and get on medication if and when that's necessary. There's nothing wrong with taking medication if you have to. There's nothing wrong with using it as a resource and a tool under, especially under the, not especially under the guidance of a professional. It's there for us as a resource. It's there for us as a tool. And I love that she wasn't ashamed to post that because there is no shame behind it. Although a lot of people, there's such a stigma, don't wanna share that. I love that she shared that for other people to see that she is putting herself first, that she's using the tools she's going for help because she it was in such a place of despair and hopelessness she reached out for a lifeline she did whatever she could to help her better herself and her mental health and i love that and i hope that you take that as a lesson that if you need to go get help honestly i think we all could use some therapy in our lives go there is no shame it's a huge lesson for all of us number five self-care and putting herself first. As prison wives, we give so much to our loved ones. A lot of times it's because there are so many confines. They have so many restrictions. We want to be able to help them and give them whatever we can. And a lot of times that means putting ourselves last and neglecting our own wants and needs. I have to say I did that when Adam was incarcerated. And even in the beginning of him re-entering, I was still kind of falling victim to doing that. It's just the way that we kind of learn to live. And it's not necessarily always okay. Yes, you want to help them. It's just the way I was raised like you do that for the people that you love it brings me joy but it shouldn't be at your own expense because honestly it could take a toll on your health and it takes a toll on your relationship so i'm asking you in this moment how can you prioritize yourself around whatever crap situation that you're going through right now what can you do in these times of despair that'll lift your spirits and even if you're not in a time of despair right now write it down make a list of them and put it someplace that it's easy for you to find and access because you might forget in those moments and you just need to go look 
be like, oh, I love cooking. I love trying new recipes. Go buy the ingredients when he's in lockdown. So you're not constantly thinking about what happened, how long is it gonna be, is he okay? What's he thinking about? I know this woman loves her dogs. She loves to hike. She loves to go out with her friends and have a dancing great time. She also sometimes loves to order a pizza and stay home and watch a movie or talk on the phone with her friends or whatever she loves to do. So I encourage her to do any of those or all of those or one of those, whatever it is, to get herself back to herself and centered because that's what's gonna help pull her through. Those are the things that she can rely on to bring her joy. What is it that you can do? And then we have a bonus, number six, a positive outlook and attitude. Maybe her future won't look like what she's expected it to look like over the past few years, or maybe it will, but she just doesn't know that right now in the moment. She has to live to be happy today, right now, and not have anxiety or future trip, as a lot of people call it, because that's what causes the anxiety and the despair. So the fact that she's like, I'm letting go, I'm done, I have no feelings associated with it, I'm apathetic, I am not touching his legal stuff anymore, somebody else can, is helping her live right now in the moment and not having to deal with that legal stuff, that torture, those clemency hearings that are fixed, that she knows what the outcome's gonna be before it even happens, live like that today. So then this way you're extremely surprised if it does happen or you're opening the door for something you barely even expect or knew could possibly happen to open because you have no expectations. You're just focused on living your best life and finding your happiness and your joy right now in the, mo in the moment. Because at the end of the day, as morbid as this might sound, that's the only thing you're promised is right now, this very moment. I just want to reiterate how proud I am of my friend, this woman. I'm proud of her strength. I'm proud that she's at a point where she's making concrete decisions. I'm proud that she's getting help from a professional and that she's prioritizing her own mental health and her own sanity. I am sending so much love to her and so much love to you because if this can help you get through your traumatic times in life, then I hope it does. Please take what you want from this, leave what didn't resonate, go on and have an amazing day. Keep staying strong, keep loving strong, keep supporting one another through this journey because you're one day closer to your happily ever after, whatever that may be, we don't even know. You are happy in this moment. I love you guys and I'll see you in the next one.